A very warm welcome to all of you on this uh, Monday night uh, here at our lovely Faculty of Architecture in the Built Environment. My name is uh, Ellen van Buren, Head of the Management in the Built Environment Department uh, at this Faculty of Architecture in the Built Environment. And next to me is Professor Joe Williams from UCL, the Bartlett School of Planning. Uh, Joe, you're a professor of sustainable development, also a visiting professor uh, at uh, our faculty. Um, tonight, Joe will introduce us to uh, Circular Cities, a revolution in sustainable urban systems, uh, the title of a book that she has also authored. There's the book. Um, it, uh, it is a brilliant, um, well, you can judge for yourself after hearing Joe's lecture, but I think it's a brilliant account of a holistic view of uh, sustainable cities and what the circularity dimension uh, can bring and can add to it uh, compared or in addition to our uh, sort of traditional notions of sustainability, uh, sustainable buildings and from the building level up to the urban level and the urban system level. Um, we will have a 45 minutes lecture of Joe, uh, after which we'll have a, a discussion uh, moderated by me, but also introduced by Olga Iano and uh, Alexander Wendel, uh, both uh, directors of the Circular Built Environment Hub at this faculty. Um, there will be a live stream available and it will be recorded for the first 45 minutes during uh, Joe's lecture, after which uh, we will cut off the live stream uh, recording and we will have a more lively debate with the audience here. Uh, very good uh, for you to show up in such big numbers and I'm sure we'll have a lovely discussion uh, afterwards. But first, Joe, uh, the floor is yours. Uh, we're looking forward to your lecture. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ellen. Thank you to you, Dal, for inviting me to be a visiting lecturer here. And thank you for the opportunity to talk to you all today. Really appreciate it. And I, I hope you'll find this interesting and possibly inspiring. You never know. Um, so in the first 250,000 years we've been on the planet, the human population grew to a billion. In the last 200 years, it's grown sevenfold to seven billion people. This is the crux of the problem that I'm gonna be talking about tonight. And really, the crux of the problem is that we consume too many resources and we also consume 
all the ecosystem services on the planet. And in fact, we consume so much that we are now consuming considerably more than our planet can give us. And of course, it looks like the population is set to increase further, up to 2050 for sure, probably to about 9 billion. So this is the problem that we're facing. In the Netherlands, um, you have seen a similar level of growth in consumption over a time period, which you can see here from the 1960s until 2018. You can also see that from about 2008, um, which is, is basically the point at which you had a financial crisis, that there was actually a quite a sort of steep decline since then in terms of resource consumption. You can see from the graph here as well that indeed a similar occurrence at a European level has been seen and this is largely down to the fact that there's been a, a huge amount of activity in terms of trying to decarbonise, so through policy and regulatory um, instruments and so on. But having said that, you can still see that obviously the levels of consumption are high and they are currently above the world biocapacity and certainly above Dutch biocapacity. So currently, only 14% of the Netherlands' overall consumption footprint can be satisfied domestically, um, which basically means everything else has to come from somewhere else, whether it's the resources or the global ecosystem services that we all need to consume to survive, essentially. And in terms of that footprint, in terms of consumption, um, the, actually, the biggest category, 33% of the Netherlands overall consumption footprint is actually associated to food. Then it's services, housing, goods, and personal transportation. Um, but food accounts for about 33% of consumption, and most of that is imported. And of course, that has knock-on impacts to the places from which it's imported, both negative and positive. So I am an urbanist, and so I'm interested from the perspective of, of what urban systems can do to try and address this problem. And this, this particular graphic comes from a report which was looking at resource consumption, ecological footprints across cities in the Mediterranean area um, of Europe. And what it shows are the different areas of consumption, but also where is consuming more or less across, across those areas. Cities, urban systems, and I would like you to, if just for, the, for this lecture, think of them as urban systems. So if you have a city, it's obviously connected to many satellites. It's connected to rural areas. It's connected to marine systems. It's connected to sort of port systems all around the world, one city. Um, and that is the urban system from where your, your resources and also potentially your ecosystem services come from. So it, it's not on its own, it's not an island. And therefore, changing policy and regulation and, and technology and practice, social practices and so on in cities can make a, a huge difference. By 2050, as I mentioned earlier, we're looking at about a 9 billion uh, sized population and 70% of those people will be living in urban areas. Currently, we consume about 75% of the world's resources, we produce 50% of the world's waste, and we also produce about 80% of the greenhouse gas emissions, which of course is a, another a form of waste. The size of the system that's required to support urban systems across the planet is already bigger than anything that can be supported ec ecologically on the planet. So there's a huge imperative, if you like, for cities and urban systems to address this issue. But also, in some ways, cities and urban systems are in a bit of a difficult situation, essentially because often the urban ecosystems are the most degraded ecosystems, which also means it's quite difficult for them to produce their own resources. Um, also, it can be difficult for them to assimilate their own waste. And 
Often we see degraded natural cycles as well as the technospheric cycles, which I'm sure you're all most um, sort of um, cogent with in terms of thinking about circularity and uh, circular economy, for example. So in order to change this, we need to look at, I suppose, restoring, at the very least, if not regenerating, ecologically regenerating these urban systems to enable greater carrying capacity within those systems. But at the same time, we've also got to look at how we shrink the demand we're placing on those systems in the first place. Of course, the thing about cities, cities are places where there's a lot of money, there's a lot of political power, there are a lot of levers and tools where you can make changes, there's a lot of good ideas. So these are also reasons why this, this, these, these could be the centres of innovation. And finally, if we haven't got enough kind of impetus or momentum already to actually deal with this within cities, cities are also going to face the biggest problems in terms of resource security for food, water, energy, and so on. So in terms of thinking about cities as systems, I want you also to think about the activities that happen in cities. Lots of different ecological, economic activities, social activities, lots of things happen in cities. And all of these activities will consume resources and they will produce waste products, most likely. And they will also consume ecosystem services, but in some instances, some of those activities may also help to regenerate those ecosystem services. But what we do need to think about is how this system then interrelates with its global periphery, if you like. So I'm sure most of you have come across the Ellen MacArthur Foundation Resolve diagram. It's what everyone uses when you talk about circular economy. And it's, it's essentially all about trying to create technospheric cycles, which you have on the right-hand side of the diagram in blue, and biospheric, uh, biological cycles, if you like, on the left-hand side of the diagram. And it's, and it's useful in many ways, because what it does start to do is it starts to identify, if you like, strategies for achieving what I'm talking about. But the problem, I suppose, with, with the sort of Ellen MacArthur Foundation definition and, and this particular model is that it's not best fit for urban systems. It was designed really with industrial sectors in mind and business models in mind, rather than thinking about urban systems, which of course are much more complicated than um, a business model, for example. Um, you involve many more actors, you involve civil society, you involve government in these processes, not just the um, the sort of owner of a business, for example, or the suppliers for a business. You're, so you're involving people with different motivations within that as well. So aligning those motivations in order to get this kind of the symbiotic relationships you need for any kind of resource looping, for example, um, is much more complex than that. Another fundamental problem with this particular conceptualization, I suppose, of circular economy is, uh, as with most economics, um, it's not grounded in a spatial context. So it doesn't take into account, essentially, where that system is operating, what the culture is there, what the social practices and lifestyles are, what the politics is there, what the economic system is there, how these things work. Um, nor does it take into account that things happen at different scales within that spatial context, and then the impact of the, those activities in, those, in the other connected locations across, across many scales. So I suppose the territorialization of this process is also extremely important, particularly when you're coming to design, engineer, govern, manage resources within cities. And the other thing that the, the focus is largely obviously on materials and I suppose, you know, 
what we do think of as infrastructural systems are thought of in terms of their materials and their, 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 their constituent materials and values rather than infrastructure, say empty housing, for example, um, abandoned energy systems, things that may indeed be used or reused again. And we're not also thinking about land. And land not only from the point of view of the spatial context that I've just mentioned and the scale and things that it operates at, but also thinking in terms of if we do build this particular uh, new commercial business center here, what happens to the ecosystem services which are currently provided by the land within this area? What happens to the wider natural cycles that surround this as a result? So it's really thinking about also about land not only as a resource in its own right, but the, the, if you like, the services that that land offers as well. None of those things are really kind of built into it. I suppose, and hence, I, as I say, I'm an urbanist when sort of circular economy was talked about and circularity was talked about. Um, it was very much coming from this economic um, sort of uh, paradigm, if you like. And yet, where I had seen circularity done best at that stage, which was sort of 15 odd years ago, was really in, in Nordic cities where they put in various types of energy recovery systems, which, you know, at the time, things like the Hammerby model were, you know, very, very innovative. And they were doing this at an urban scale. They weren't, they weren't doing this for one business and they weren't doing this um, for an industrial sector. So I was, I was interested in in how this might look, I suppose, for an urban system. And it seemed very apparent to me that we, what we really needed to look at was all of the resource flows, so energy, material, water, um, land, and infrastructure. We needed to think about the urban system rather than the economic system. We needed a more socio-ecological focus, which was focused on you know, es essentially delivering uh, greater ecological integrity, but at the same time delivering in terms of, of social equity and social justice. Um, and we wanted, and we should really move away from this idea that circular economy is all about economic efficiency and growth models. And it needed to be territorialized. So the idea here really was to bring three things together, which actually work very well together in synergy, which is resource looping, uh, which is uh, recycling, reuse, and energy recovery. And working that together with, with natural cycles but through the process of ecological regeneration. And then also bringing into that the need for adaptation, not, in, not only in terms of the way we design our infrastructure, but also in the way that we support our communities so that they can be adaptive. So that they have if you like, the expertise to adapt, but also they have the financial wherewithal to adapt to sort of changes that are occurring around them. And, you know, just to give you some ideas, there's lots of different things that could come under this banner, but all sorts of things like the bioremediation of sites, urban sites, things like the, the circular food systems, which might be about food re reuse schemes alongside um, urban agriculture, for example, and anaerobic digestion. You've got industrial symbiosis, which I suppose in many ways is where this came from in the first place. Um, you've got grey water recycling, you've got circular bioeconomy, all of these different activities um, sort of filter in to the types of things you'd expect to be seeing um, in these systems. So what I'm really interested in is how you implement it. So how do you do it? Um, so at the time when I started doing research in this area, which was back in about 2014, so it's a long time ago now, um, it seemed that there were, you know, there's various leaders in Europe for sure. There were also some very innovative cities that were emerging in China that were doing things in a slightly different way, but were still trying to adopt um, a similar sorts of approaches. Um, I want to look at the different types of solutions that are out there, and there are different types. I wanted to know why people did it, what were the benefits of doing it, 
I want you to understand how, by implementing these kind of strategies within cities, how did they interact with what was already going on within the city? So again, it's thinking about the system rather than just thinking about you know, reuse on its own or recycling on its own. It's thinking about how do the strategies that are currently in the city interact with this and what are the likely outcomes. I wanted to know what levers cities had used to make this happen and I wanted to know what challenges they'd encountered in doing this. And I did also look um, particularly at the role of planning in that. And the first thing was, okay, why are we even bothering? Why are we doing this? And, you know, on, on, there was an awful lot of data and material out there. Um, I looked at this in its sort of European case studies, but I also looked through sort of international literature, which comes from across the world, essentially. Um, and it became very apparent that there were lots of benefits that would come from this. These are highlighted here. And in broad terms, we had health benefits, ecological benefits, community benefits, and economic benefits. And I'm not going to go through all of them. There's an awful lot of them. Um, but what I found interesting was I expected the ecological benefits. I expected there'd be a reduction, for example, in resource consumption overall. Um, I'd, I expected that there would be employment generated, potentially, um, from adopting this kind of approach. What I didn't expect to see were so many social benefits that actually seem to start accruing from this, particularly as one of the critiques, for example, of circular economy is the lack of sort of any kind of um, judge on that or, you know, any kind of control on that. So there were lots, actually, of social benefits in addition to the health benefits that you got from adopting these strategies. Um, and, and I'm going to illustrate that just briefly with um, a case study, one of the case studies that I looked at in all of this, which was Brixton. And what you started to see was that the benefits of adopting these kind of circular activities in cities was, number one, you reactivated spaces which were unused often or underutilized, which helped in the regeneration, the more kind of um, traditional regeneration process. But also, often, these projects were community-based, um, and as a result of that, I suppose, you would start to see local symbiotic capital being generated. And, and what I mean by that is you get the social capital, which binds the communities together so they can act together. You get human capital because they get expertise. Once you start being involved in things like repair cafes and urban farming or orchards or food reuse schemes or the generation of renewable energy, you learn from that. And people have then used that um, to increase their sort of employability, for example. Um, you also find that communities become more empowered. So Brixton had a very strong community, a very strong kind of um, persona, if you like, in any case. But not this particular persona, I suppose. And what it's done is brought other groups within society there together. Um, so again, it's also helped to empower communities that have been on the edge quite often um, in the past. And the other thing, perhaps the most important thing, is in Brixton, what we have are local food programs. We have local food reuse cafes. We have um, social housing with renewable energy and community sort of energy generation and so on. And what that's actually meant for those people is that they've had access to fresh food or food at all. It's meant they've had access to clean energy or energy at all um, in many cases. So it's um, the repair cafes and the sort of various sort of technology um, warehouse type projects have also generated not only jobs, but also, again, access to all sorts of um, goods, essentially, that people wouldn't necessarily have been able to access otherwise. So it also has created a degree of solidarity as a result of that. Um, and this builds adaptiveness, actually, within the population. These, these sort of this local symbiotic capital, if you like, starts to do that. And Paris recognised that before 
um, really any of the other kind of major cities in Europe, I think, because they built that into their circular strategy. So they had solidarity built into their strategy, and that was one of their focuses. And they were certainly looking at regional food looping systems. And again, it was about food reuse as well as things like urban farming, and it was within the region. Um, they also engaged a lot in recycled, sort of refurbished goods, particularly things like furniture, in actual fact, for people who've been sort of homeless or um, in low income groups and so on. But they also, there was a lot of reuse of existing buildings through various schemes, so including sort of rehousing home, the homeless, but also people within sort of lower income groups. So, again, this is a form of circularity, is it not? Um, so the next question, I suppose, really was, okay, so we have lots of other strategies which are often operating in cities. So here we can see the circular strategies on the inside of these sort of concentric circles. So we've got adapt, loop, regenerate. But on the outside, we have these other strategies which are often adopted by cities, particularly optimization, where you're looking at increased efficiencies. Um, we also have substitution, again, which is something often um, opted for in cities. And substitution could be a, a sort of something as bland as trying to shift cars, uh, people out of cars onto public transport, or it could be about basically moving to more renewable energy sources. Um, Sharing cities, so lots of different things like uh, car share or co-housing or lots of other things. Um, and localizing, which as we've certainly seen or I saw in, in Paris was one of their solutions. So they've looked at localizing um, resource loops for construction and food, for example. And it's something that's also, of course, been done in Amsterdam. Um, but what I was interested in was, well, yeah, okay, what happens between those actions? So do those existing actions then promote what's happening in terms of circular strategies or do they undermine it? What happens? And um, it was a very mixed picture, honestly. So for example, if you're looking at localization, on the one side, if you localize resource loops, you reduce the costs and therefore make it economically viable. So therefore, localization works well with resource looping. But on the other hand, what we found in London was, but you often don't have adequate resources to then supply the local population if you want producers and consumers within the same area. So localization sometimes doesn't work under those sort of auspices, if you like. Um, but we also saw there were definite conflicts, for example, unsurprisingly, between things like um, uh, trying to move towards renewable energy, which we saw in the Nordics, when you've already got district heating systems which rely on, on uh, waste. And so shifting away from waste um, towards renewable energy systems was, was difficult. And also, how do you run um, waste systems without large amounts of waste? So it doesn't work very well with efficiency either. But this is, um, we also, this is kind of the systems diagram which looks at all of these things and looks at how different things interact or different strategies might interact with each other. And it's obviously not comprehensive. Um, but what it does is it starts to give you an idea about where you might see barrier, you might see conflicts and you might see synergies. And the interesting thing that we found, or I've, I found in all of this was that, that for the circular strategies, for adaptation, looping, and ecological regeneration, there are a lot of synergies. So they do work very well together. Um, so for example, if you're looking, this is Stockholm Royal Seaport. And here you have um, an example of that synergy happening between um, basically looping actions, and ecological regeneration and adaptive actions. So if we look at the organic waste which is produced on the ships in the port, um, what happened was that the, the, the city council decided that it was going to take that waste and use it to create biogas, 
number one, and number two, to create compost, which it then used in the national park, which is sort of just outside, basically, of this, this seaport area. So it was used for ecological regeneration on the one side, and on the other side, by producing biogas, what you're looking at is an increase in adaptiveness because basically if, if, the, if the city's hit, if you like, by another energy crisis, and it has been hit many times by energy crises, this might perform part of the solution to that problem, the fact that you're using basically the sewage from the boats to generate this. Similarly here, we've got an example where we've got a huge grey water recycling system, which is a, across this whole area um, and that's obviously resource looping and again what that has done is it's reduced the amount of overspill into the sewerage systems which stops pollution in the harbour um, on the one hand and also it provides a water supply in the summer because they also suffer from problems of drought during the summer months. So you get this kind of adaptive looping ecolog ecologically regenerative kind of system. Okay, so then I looked at challenges and that just gave me a headache and I thought I might give up at that point. Um, but there were a lot of challenges. And I have to say this, this list, this kind of diagram, which you can, you know, it's online. I think you can freely access it. Um, it's also in that book. There was just a huge number of different types of challenges. And the challenges that you would expect to face are very different, not surprisingly, depending on what you're looking at, depending on the action. So if you're looking at circular construction, they're very different to if you're looking at ecological regeneration or creating food cycles. All of them have very different types of challenges. Um, but also, context makes a big difference. So I looked at the difference between some Chinese cities and the types of barriers that were seen there as opposed to the types of barriers that were being seen in European cities. And again, very different, unsurprisingly. But it does further highlight the need for very contextually relevant solutions to these problems. And this, hopefully, is visible now, just about. And again, this is a paper you can download online, which is free, um, which is basically highlighting some of these challenges. So I, I looked at this in London in quite a lot of detail, and I looked at the different types of actions. Now, London is a strange place, and it has a big problem, as I'm sure you're all aware, um, with land markets and property markets. So land value there is extremely high. And that's one of the biggest challenges that are faced in terms of moving towards this kind of more regenerative approach. Because unfortunately, things like repair cafes and urban farming and even storage sites for construct the construction industry um, basically are low value uses. And they can't compete for space against high end residential and commercial development. So in London, that's, that's a huge problem. Another problem in London is our utter lack of regulation, really, um, and the fact that we depend very heavily on the private sector and also on civic society to deliver the solutions that we want. Um, so, again, there was, there's been a lot of fantastic schemes that have been set up, um, often on temporary sites, um, all sorts of agriculture, sort of circular food systems, um, you know, energy projects even, um, that have eventually lost their spaces, that it's only been for a temporary time and a temporary use. And if you want to see a transition um, it, it, within any sort of system, it has to be for longer periods of time. So again, this sort of reliance on communities, civic society on their own to do it without funding and without support is also a big problem because you've got the temporary spaces and then you're basically rely relying on volunteers. And what happens is these schemes fold and the expertise is lost that's been generated. So again, this is something which is starting to be addressed now in terms of the longevity and the availability of these sites and the need to actually sort of support civic society. Okay, in terms of looking at the different types of actions, um, it's quite interesting as well because it's very different, very different challenges. So for circular construction in the UK and London at least, the biggest problem probably is, again, institutional inertia. 
within the construction industry to change. There are innovators, but generally speaking, the construction industry will hide behind the fact that without um, specific design guidance, without regulation to create a level playing field, if you like, in terms of their delivery and so on, that those changes are less than likely to be made. We had a very similar experience with our zero carbon building. In actual fact, our zero carbon building policy was, was, was quite effective for a short period of time um, because it was actually very well designed. But unfortunately, on its removal, what we saw was that um, sort of developers then basically reverted to type and stopped building to these much higher standards. So in the institutional inertia here is, and the path dependencies that are created by that is a big problem, a big challenge for the construction industry. Ecological regeneration on the other side, one of the big problems with that is the fact that you need long periods. Um, you need long, pro it's the, these are long processes. You know, sites need to remain open for sort of ecological um, projects for much longer periods. They're very low value uses. And then on top of that, there's a problem with, with ongoing maintenance and how that's funded and who does it, whether it's the local community or whether there's private contractors that are paid for. But in a time when, you know, there's greater and greater austerity in terms of, of city councils and so on, the money apparently isn't there to look after these. And again, it's lack of value that's actually given to those systems. Circular tactical urbanism, I've described this, this process, but what that really is about is about when spaces within cities are used for these kind of activities, whether they're within buildings or on sites. Um, and again, there are issues around this, usually relating to land value um, and the low value of activities. Um, that you're looking at. But again, spatial planning is very useful in terms of intervening within this. And then circular food systems, again, one of the biggest problems is a lack of land, the scarcity of land, but it's also about the scale of demand and the value, again, placed on food. So in London, they're starting to get around this through thing, regulation, really, and also public procurement, which again, um, you know, it's, it's sort of following on really from what was, has been done in Paris for, for quite some time and has been very successful. But there's very, because we're looking at such a wide range of different activities, you're going to need different types of solutions um, and different types of levers, if you like, to overcome these problems. And the levers really fall into three categories. If you're lucky, you're a city which is in charge of public provisioning of water and energy and public transport and housing and, and other services, waste services and so on. So you can directly change your practices. In many cities, you're not in that situation, um, whereupon sort of legislation, uh, sort of strategies, planning sort of strategies, um, sort of conditional agreements, um, subsidies, public procurement are going to be your go-to levers most likely for change. But also, and the thing that's done most often, for example, in a city like London, is we're looking at capacity building, which might be about providing temporary spaces for short periods of time. It might be about very small amounts of money. But usually what it's about is setting up networks and data platforms and so on, and potentially experiments as well, possibly building sort of in training as well to, to start to deliver these sorts of solutions. But within this, planning is, is potentially a good tool, although definitely not on its own, because it can intervene in land markets, so it can, to an extent, overcome these difficulties with low-value activities and compete with the higher-value activities um, through things like temporary permissions or provision of land alongside contractual agreements for the way in which you develop, a bit like was done in De Kerville, for example. Um, it might also be that if you have a spatial plan that provides an indication of the direction of travel for potential investors. Um, so again, that helps innovate, that provides some support for innovation because you know that your investment will reap a reward at the end of it. 
Obviously, if you take a much more collaborative approach to planning as well, people can exchange knowledge, but they can also start to create the relationships you need. For example, if you want to create um, sort of uh, closed loops. Um, but again, I mentioned decurval two minutes ago, but also the suspension of planning can be useful on occasion. So in decurval, the suspension of planning, which basically meant that uh, new approaches to building on contaminated land could be tested, was extremely useful. So planning or unplanning can be useful in different ways, if you like. Um, having said that, certainly from the research that I've done so far, it's a lot less effective than either the complete reform of the economic system, which would be ideal, um, or directly sort of direct regulation, for example, legislation like they've got again in France, which ensures the reuse of food. Um, okay. So all of this is encapsulated in these, these various um, publications and in this book. Um, you can access most of this online and most of it is open access. Feel free to do so and also feel free to contact me if you are interested in, in discussing any of these um, points any further. Um, I also want to just mention the fact that we are building a partnership between TU Delft and UCL. There are two hubs at UCL. There's the Circular Cities um, hub and then the Circle Lab, both working on different aspects. Circle Lab more on things like the circular built environment. Um, the Circular Cities hub more about the types of things I've been discussing today. Um, and we are working with the, the Circular Built Environment hub here at TU Delft and various of the colleagues in the front row. Um, and we are hoping to, well, we've already started with a PhD exchange program. Felipe, who's in the audience over here, came to UCL earlier this year um, to basically study the systems in London. Um, and uh, one of my PhD students will be coming out later this year, but we hope to expand that out to other interested parties, should they wish to, um, in the future. Um, and we are also currently engaged in this, which is a seminar series, which again, I hope you will be able to come to, or at least watch online, even if you can't make it. We're going to have the circulars looking for space for circularity, looking at localizing the loops into bioregions, for example, looking at the infinite city, which is sort of everything from circular bioeconomy to renewable energy to, well, all sorts of things, um, and also governing circular systems. So anything from looking at sort of circular transitions to looking at how really circular policy is being used to sort of regenerate areas. For example, Parkstad Limburg, as, as one of my PhD students is looking up um, in, in the Netherlands. So we're already working together. We hope to work together a lot more in the future. We would love you to come to the, the circulars and participate. Um, thank you. Thank you, Joe. That was a very uh, inspiring lecture. It's a whole lot that you brought to us as well. Uh, so I can imagine that it's also uh, a lot of uh, food for thought. Um, we will have now, um, together with the audience here, so sorry for the online viewers, we're going to cut off the online um, um, recording now. Um, and we continue with the 